Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. Good afternoon to everyone who's here in person and to um, those that are watching on the live stream and those that watch later. Um, thank you for being with us. My name is Winnie, I'm the Rector of St. Luke's, and I get to do the introductions. Um, so this is the second of our series um, that is, we're calling it the Ebenezer St. Luke series forums, and um, they are a way for us to bring a, a major speaker um, here to Atlanta and to be in conversation. Um, and this is an extension, or it's grown out of our book reading together, our Lenten book series. So this is just the second time we've done it. Um, and today we get to do it with John Bond, um, the executive pastor of Ebenezer, um, the privilege for us. And our guest today is Brian McLaren, who, as you saw um, as we were coming into the room, is really no guest to many people here. Um, <laughs> Seems like old home week. Lots of people are, are dear old friends of Brian's. So this is a, a wonderful opportunity for us. But let me just do the formal part um, and tell you who Brian is according to the people out in the world. Um, Brian McLaren is an author, speaker, activist, and public theologian. He was a formerly a uh, university English uh, teacher and I, I, professor is what I would call that and a passionate advocate for a new kind of Christianity, which is just, generous, working with people of all faiths for the common good. He is known to many of you as a faculty member of the Living School and a podcaster with Learning How to See, which is part of the Center for Action and Con Contemplation, which you all know through Richard Rohr. He is also an Auburn Senior Fellow, um, Auburn where John Vaughn was um, before, and is a co-host of Southern Lights, which just happened and I hear we're all going next year. Um, I didn't know to go this year. His newest book called Faith After Doubt, um, he's, got a, he's got it here with him and he'll tell you more about it. Um, and I, I'm curious about how it ends, I haven't read it yet. And um, his, oh, excuse me, Faith After Doubt, we have read. This life. is the one I haven't read. Do I Stay Christian? That's the one I'm curious about how that one ends, we'll see. <laughs> um, can be pre Do I Stay Christian can be pre-ordered, he's got copies with him. And I probably said enough things. Um, I think the thing that might actually be important for you all to know is Brian McLaren um, founded a church and, and did that, like very successfully ran good big church that started around his kitchen table, if I remember the story correctly. Um, and like for 25 years, is that right? 24 years? I was there for 24, yeah. And in the process of, of doing that and of exploring his faith and investigating what it means to be a Christian and to be in Christian organizations, frankly, has been, is one of the major thinkers in our time um, of the, the, around the culture of Christianity, um, the culture that we bring to Christianity and the possibilities for it um, in the American religious space. And of course, he engages outside of America, but um, is, is critical um, and has been a critical thinker for many of us in how we think about a broad and just expansive Christianity. And for those of us from the main line, um, very important, um, and maybe even more importantly for the evangelical movement, which is much larger than us, 
um, is, is one of the primary voices that have guided that movement um, towards a, a greater sense of itself. Um, so we're, we're very, very honored to have you here. I'm so happy to be here. <laughs> and we have some questions for you. And I'm, I think I'm supposed to pray, but I feel like I've been, been praying a lot today. John, would you, would you pray? Why not? Why not? Yeah. We pray a little over at Ebenezer, too. <laughs> <laughs> do you? We do. do you? But I'd be glad to open us. Let us take a moment to pray. God, you who are the source of all that is, you who are Alpha and Omega, the ground of our being. We thank you for being together. We thank you for this partnership, the journey that our congregations are walking together. Through the twists and the turns, continue to lead us, continue to ground us. We thank you for the ministry of Brian. We thank you for the ways in which you are speaking through him and leading him. We pray now in this time together that we may be open to your Pentecost spirit today as we remember the birth of the church. May your Pentecost spirit be present, may it enliven us, and may it set us free. Amen. We claim your presence and blessings in the name of that spirit. Amen. 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 So I'll, I'll go ahead and start us off. Um, so first, let me bring you greetings from Pastor Warnock. Um, when we were doing the scheduling and had to shift some things, he had to preach. He's preaching in Athens today. So part of the church is going to Athens today, and we've got some folks here, and we've got many folks online through the Ebenezer Everywhere community, as well as the St. Luke's community. But first, um, so bring you greetings from Pastor Warnock today. Um, and Brian, welcome. We're really glad that you are here with us. So I'm, I always love to ask the opening this question. So why'd you say yes <laughs> to coming, you know, come in here, come in hanging out, you know, with this, the Baptists and the Episcopalians today? Gosh, it feels really good to be between a Baptist and an Episcopalian. <laughs> I just feel really good about that. Um, <laughs> and uh, I should say, anytime I can hang out with you two, I'm, I'm there. So we wouldn't have even needed a reason. But, um, you know, we, we want to talk about climate change today. And I am one of those people who wakes up every single day. One of the first thoughts in my mind is that the entire human species has to find a new way of relating to the earth. And... I also wake up every day feeling that the Christian religion is one of the greatest threats to human beings getting that new vision. But the Christian faith could be one of the greatest leaders in that process. So that's, that's enough to, to get me here too. So you kind of unpack that one for yeah. us. I mean, I think that's, that's, so in what ways are, is the Christian religious the greatest threat, but also the greatest hope? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I, I was thinking right before we, we came out, if, if I could read a couple yes, of paragraphs, please. because um, in this book I, I just wrote called Do I Stay Christian? Um, I, there's a chapter, I, the, the book is divided into three parts. Part one is called No, <laughs> and I try to give the 10 best reasons I'm aware of not to stay Christian. Um, and then part two is called Yes, and I basically say, uh, explore could you have your eyes wide open to the first 10 r chapters and still say yes? So that's what happens in the middle part. And then in the third part, I say, whether you say yes or no, uh, you wake up tomorrow and you have to live. So what kind of human beings do we want to be, whether we have that label mm. and identity of Christian or not? But in the first part, talking about reasons not to stay Christian, uh, I... Uh, have a chapter about what I call constricted intellectualism. And what I mean by this is that uh, there is a, certainly an anti-intellectual strain in every religion, right? But certainly in Christianity. But I think more harmful than the anti-intellectual strain is a constricted intellectual strain that says you use your mind to convince yourself of what you're already supposed to think. In other words, you, you use your mind not to explore, not to learn, not to break new ground. You use your mind as a massive 
exercising confirmation bias, if you know what that, that means. And then I talk about how this problem um, uh, of, uh, of constricted intellectualism I actually think is a threat to human survival. And I, I talk about two different primary areas. The first is a lot of Christians, and if you think, uh, see, I come from a fundamentalist background, um, so I know this from the inside, um, but a lot of Christians think to be a good Christian, you must believe that God plans to destroy the world very soon. And if you have this idea that God's going to destroy the world and suck up all the souls of good people to heaven, or people who believe the right things or whatever, uh, if that's what you believe, then in a sense, why not destroy the earth? Why not suck out all the oil? Why not warm up the, the atmosphere? Why not kill all the fish? You know, if, if, if it's gonna be destroyed soon anyway. Hmm. And, and that is a deeply held belief. Not only that, some believe that the, they look at, I think, grossly misread passages in the Bible to say the world's going to burn up uh, and, and they think that that sounds like nuclear war. And so, believe me, there are many, many Christians who believe that it's God's will for a nuclear war to happen to destroy the world. Can you see how believing that could affect your politics in some really scary ways? By the way, there's streams of Islam who have a similar belief. You put those two together, and that's a really dangerous cocktail. So that's the fast way that we could that Christian belief could destroy the world. The slow way, I say, um, uh, I, I talk about, I say millions of Christians around the world know, as I do, that this suicidal theology is waiting like a huge cache of explosives in hundreds of millions of Christian hearts and minds, ready to be detonated in a global chain reaction at any moment of self-fulfilling prophecy of apocalyptic proportions um, and, uh, uh, and from there I, I say um, instead of a fast nuclear catastrophe related to uranium this is a slow motion catastrophe related to carbon. Mm. Make no mistake, it might take decades, maybe a century, but if the entire human race does not come together to address climate change, sea levels will rise fast and high, reaching catastrophic levels. Droughts, floods, wildfire, fires, other extreme weather events will intensify. Crops will fail over large areas, causing widespread hunger and economic turmoil. Coastal cities where hundreds of millions of people live will become uninhabitable, causing people to become refugees in unimaginable numbers. I don't want to read any more just because I think all of you know those facts. And then I said, it would be nice if we could count on the world's largest religion to be of help in taking preemptive action, but I would say the odds are strongly stacked against it based on my experience as a Christian. There is a lot of money to be made and power to be gained by short-sighted leaders, political or religious, who tell people what they want to hear, basically. And so this, to me, is this huge challenge we have that the Christian religion has created the same anti-science bias that made people doubt the uh, pandemic also makes them doubt, uh, you know, measures, easily measurable things. I've lived mm -hmm. in Florida for 14 years. I live on the Gulf Coast. Um, the sea level in the Gulf of Mexico rises an eighth of an inch a year. So just in the 14 years I've lived there, we're closing in on two inches of sea level rise. Um, and when you get to be my age, you know, 10 years is not very long. <laughs> so, uh, so you just realize, yeah, this is a matter of, in my mind, it's a matter of urgency. And ironically, the Christian faith could be, ex it just, it could be expediting and leading the way and helping 30% uh, uh, of the world's population, 30 to 33% of the world's population to get motivated and find spiritual motivation for loving and caring for the earth. So that's to me the, another reason why a conversation like this is so important. Well, and you, you just said that you, you come from a fundamentalist background. Yes. So that's that constricted intellectualism you're yes. talking about. So tell us a little bit about your journey and does that apply to how we think about this 
frankly, majority and very in influential part of the yes. faith can be impacted. So I have to tell you a story about this. Um, if you want to look this up online, you would Google the term Sandy Cove Conference. But what happened is years ago, I can't remember, early 2000s, I got an invitation to a conference near where I lived. Back then, I lived in Maryland. And, um, and it was supposed to be a gathering of evangelical Christians. And that was my background. And probably in 2005, I still would have used that label. I, I, you know, I, I don't care what label peop other people use, but it's not really a label that works that well for me anymore. So I, I got an invitation to be there to talk about climate change. And I thought, I'm going to meet all the evangelicals who care about climate change. And I got there and I found out that there were like four of us who understood it and cared about it and 75 who got paid to be there by a grant so they didn't get it. The great news was they had the best speakers they could have had. A lot of people didn't know this, but the head of the intergovernmental panel on climate change, Sir John Houghton, was a committed Christian, uh, uh, Anglican Christian, uh, from obviously from England. Um, uh, he was there. They just had an incredible array of speakers. After one morning, nobody could have been sitting there who wasn't convinced that climate change is real. So then, you would, so then the leaders and organizers say, so we'd like to come together to make a statement. Uh, if, if we can get evangelical leaders like the ones gathered here, it'll be great. So I've got to make a tactical decision right now if I mention the name of the denomination. Leaders of a major evangelical denomination that has been in the headlines lately. That's all I'm <laughs> going to say. A, a leader from that denomination was there and he raised his hand and he said, I'm sorry if you make a statement I will not be able to sign it. If I signed it, I would be fired. And he says this in front of everybody. The, and he represented the largest single group of people there. So the organizers say, why can't you sign it? Here's what he said. He said, because we believe in small government and a problem this big requires big government solutions, so we will oppose it. <laughs> you know. Wow. I mean, it was stunning. The entire agenda of the event was th thrown off the rails now. So hmm. we go to the break, and I go out in the hallway, and Sir John is, uh, most of us are drinking coffee. He was pouring some tea. And I went to him, and I said, I don't know how you can stand a, a meeting like this. I don't know how you can stand it you just presented this incredibly convincing information. And then a Christian leader responds, not with a theological complaint, but with an economic and political, uh, you know, deal breaker. And here's, I'll never forget what he said to me. He said, I have no choice but to stay here and work on this. He said, if... Uh, 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 George Bush was president in those years. He said, uh, if uh, America is the largest producer of uh, single uh, greenhouse gases, and I know that now, you know, th th there's sort of a race to, between China, uh, the U.S., India, who will be the greatest greenhouse gas producer, <laughs> not a race you want to be in. Mm. But uh, he, he said, America is the biggest producer of greenhouse gases. And he said... In fact, I remember he said, even Russia is, is going to sign the Paris Agreement. He said, but as long as a Republican is in the White House, unless evangelical, white evangelicals are with us, America won't be with us. And if America isn't with us, all hope is lost. I said, Sir John, you're saying that the entire future of the earth is being held hostage by one unnamed denomination in the United States in the United States he said that's what I'm saying wow so you let that sink in uh, yeah wow that's deep uh, so th I've read it at, at, at different moments over the last you know five or ten years that there seems to be some fissures that are happening within 
you know, in some of these circles. Yeah. And some of it's around age. So younger evangelicals are saying, well, your issue's not our issues. We actually may care about the environment. We actually care about maybe poor people, yeah. you know. And I'm wondering whether, 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 whether there are, whether you're seeing inroads in this yeah. or is it still more on the margins? So I think to be fair, what I'd have to say is we, we do have, evangelicals are one issue, right? And there are so many young evangelicals who see things differently than their parents and grandparents. Thanks be to God. Mm -hmm. And the environment would be one of the issues that a lot of them would care about. Mm -hmm. um, but it's not just evangelicals. If we were to take uh, uh, Catholic, the, the Catholic Church, and especially the white sector of the Catholic Church, um, pe what people don't realize is the same politics that are in control of a lot of the evangelical world are in control of the Roman Catholic world. And guess what? They're in control of a lot of the mainline Protestant world too. The number of mainline Protestants who have never mentioned the word climate change and never preach a sermon about our responsibility to care for, for creation. I just think uh, people in a church like this would be surprised. There, how many churches, they can't say the word because when they say the word, the three biggest donors in the congregation stop writing checks. Um, and uh, in fact, I'll just tell you, I, I was just with a pastor uh, a couple of weeks ago who um, talked about a forbidden subject on a Sunday and one of his major donors came up and said, you understand that you're attacking the industry that pays that, that I make my money and help pay your salary for, which is, wow. you know, it's, it just said it very, very overtly. So, uh, so this, the control of money in the world of religion is a really big deal. And this is where I feel like I'm so grateful for, you know, churches like yours and for spiritual leaders who can kind of put on their big boy or their big girl pants and say, we are not gonna be intimidated uh, when the future of the earth is at stake. I mean, oh, God, help us. So um, there are, um, some, some of us here have little uh, note cards. I think Emily might be here and Elizabeth. Um, so just as we're talking, if you have questions that you want raised, um, there's little note cards and pens, and they'll bring those to us. So just, um, that's a piece I should have said earlier. Um, we've got a little bit of time, but think about that. But Brian, you, you're kind of skirting this one question. Um, so, something happened to you that caused you to be someone who could speak on these issues and could challenge us as a church to speak to the urgency of issues, which even I think in our most progressive um, pulpits, um, it is always treacherous to speak around any, speak on anything that isn't purely spiritual. Yes. Um, we, all, we all hear when we do that, and it's, I think it's a false division. I think yes. John and I would agree it's a false division, mm -hmm. but it's a discipline to stay in that space. It's a difficult one, and I, I'm, guessing, um, I'm guessing there's a story there, Brian. <laughs> so, well, let me just say about the environment and caring about the earth. This, uh, sorry, if you're having trouble hearing, uh, yeah, let me get that a little better there. Um, if, uh, when it comes to caring for the earth, so I as a young teenager thought I'm kind of on my way out of this religion, partly because I loved science and I thought evolution made a whole lot of sense. And when I, I realized that I wasn't allowed to believe in evolution or at least admit it and be a member of my church, I just thought, you know, I'll be 18 soon. I am so out of here. Um, and then I had this very powerful spiritual experience in my teenage years. And this experience involved me being out on a hillside uh, at night, looking at the stars and feeling, I, I, I don't like to talk about this just because you know how sometimes the most precious experiences, the more you talk about them, the more you remember talking about them and the experience almost is lost. But. It was, an, it was really this experience of the glory and grandeur of God in the stars and in the air and in the earth and in the grass and in the cows mooing in the field nearby and in my friends who were 
uh, sitting out on that same hillside and this sense of the glory and beauty and wonder of God, uh, you know, came to me in that way. And so um, uh, I, I think that's always, I think there are a lot of us that that's kind of our, uh, one of our deepest connection points, you know. Um, in, in the Catholic Church, of course, you have the Franciscan tradition that celebrates that, and, and we haven't had that kind of a tradition enough in the Protestant Church, but, um, but it's still true for a lot of us. It's really one of our, in fact, I, I think if you wanted to do an interesting survey in mainline Protestant, evangelical, Pentecostal, charismatic, how many clergy are clergy today because of an experience they had at a summer camp? Uh, or a youth retreat that was an experience outdoors in contact with nature. Uh, I do think it's a deep part of every, uh, almost everybody's spiritual experience. And so that part, you know, came naturally um, to me. But I, I really faced all of these struggles as a pastor. I, I, I avoided politics. I just wanted to be spiritual. But um, I, I realized that this country's history tells us that thousands of churches led by white people thought it was spiritual to not talk about slavery for hundreds of years. And I thought, if that continues, what new atrocities will be perpetuated? And, you, you know, I just realized that's... Uh, it's just morally bankrupt, you know? And I had this moment when he, uh, I don't know, maybe in the last, probably about eight years ago, I realized I've devoted my life to trying to help Christianity be renewed. And I thought to myself, if Christianity got renewed and didn't deal, if Christianity in America got renewed and didn't deal with its white supremacy problem, mm -hmm. the world will be a worse place. Mm. Wow. Like I would rather, and I, hate, I mean, this might sound terrible to you, but I would rather Christianity die than be renewed with more white supremacy and God on its side. You understand what I'm saying? Wow. Mm. Yeah. And I would rather, I, and look, in fact, a Native American, brilliant a Canadian F F First Nations scholar, named Wazia Tawan said, the world cannot survive another 500 years of Christian colonialism. And we sh when wow. she said colonialism, she meant not only the conquest of peoples, but the conquest of the earth, treating the earth as a slave. You understand that mm. white supremacy is so related to environmental destruction. They, they're, they're part of the same sickness you know mm. I think it's also important it's been important for us I think to not let black churches off the hook yeah either in some of this I mean when we you know we love to tell the stories of the civil rights movement and you would think every black church in this country was a part of the civil rights movement yeah which was not necessarily the case you know and in many ways you know our our folks at Ebenezer were among the minority yeah. You know, yes. and that, you know, and when, you know, Dr. King writes the letter from a Birmingham jail, he's he's also talking to black pastors. Yeah. You know, um, so uh, let me let me use that maybe as a point of entry into talking about race yeah. and climate change. Um, you know, one of the things that's been a driver for this partnership yeah. has been starting to talk about race yeah and using so last year we read cast yeah. by isabel wilkerson both of our congregations over 300 people from our congregations this past year we read the sum of us by heather mcgee once again a number of us from our congregations together and and what i've appreciated is that you know we've 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 come as our authentic selves yeah. in these relationships and um 
you know, and have been able to, you know, and have been able to go through, you know, we're walking through the crunchy moments yes. sometimes in those yes. book studies. But when you start to talk about climate, there is, there seems to me a heavily racialized yeah. experience of yeah. climate change that oftentimes doesn't get talked about. I remember when I was a funder, yeah. you know, I mean, there was a, there was a whole move to kind of, that was focusing on getting the Sierra Club and, yeah. you know, a lot of the traditional tree huggers to actually talk about race. Yes. And so... I'm curious, as you, as you kind of reflect and look at climate change, I'm interested in your view or how you're seeing race yeah. play out in this, in, this, in this struggle. Yeah, you know, I, I probably am not the ideal person to answer that because my experiences in ecological work, because for me, it's not, climate change is the most urgent but if you took climate change off the table, what, we're acidifying the oceans. Uh, and what that means is absolutely terrifying. We're depleting topsoil. Take, you know, you can, it can take 10,000 years to build a couple of inches of topsoil that can be destroyed in an afternoon with a tractor. Um, mm. So you, you, you take, there's this thing called the great insect die-off. Um, and I know a lot of people don't like bugs, but 30% of your calories depend on pollinators. And, and apart from human beings, when, when he, like, you know, think of it this way, tons, thousands of tons of insects are dying every year in every geographical location. That has an impact. If you like birds, they, the, the birds eat the insects. So this is going to have effects on bird populations. You could just take issue after issue. Mm. And where in my involvement, I've always seen great partnership. But I know mm -hmm. that, there are, that what happens is, and I think this is part of something, I, I didn't come up with this term, but I think it's an apt term. The nonprofit industrial complex works a little bit like churches that we were talking about a minute ago that if you're the Sierra Club and you can raise money about the environment and you start talking about race, some of your donors are not interested and so they cut off your funding so you don't wanna talk about it. So you end up with everybody in their narrow lanes and what that seems to me to do is end up empowering the status quo because we never challenge the underlying narrative. And to mm. me, the underlying narrative, and this is where Christian, white Christianity and th these problems are synthesized because of a kind of dominionist theology that is related to something maybe you all have heard of called the doctrine of discovery that we could talk about. It's related to a whole lot of ideas, bad ideas that have emerged in Western Christianity, not just for the last 500 years, really for the last 1500 years um, that we could talk about the theological roots of this which I would love to talk about because to me, the theology behind this is tremendously important, mm. especially if we want to heal it because we have to go very deep in healing our theology. Um, but I got into a long, complex sentence there and I lost, you but know. You're, but, uh, you're, but, but you're really, ta I mean, yeah. it's, what you're talking about, once again, is kind of the depth and the power of white supremacy. Yes. And the way it shows up an issue around issue yes. around issue around I mean it's like and it was actually I think one of the lessons of the book study for us is it's the recognition yes. that this is baked into our culture it, in so many ways that is overwhelming and and if we it really is and I maybe everybody can feel how they're related the same thing that could make La rich white people commit atrocities against fellow humans for hundreds of years can make you commit atrocities against rivers and mountains and streams and species because it's this sense of privilege, entitlement, that has God behind it. See, here's where God becomes a dangerous word. Mm. Because, like, I understand why a lot of people don't want to use the word God. Because every time they hear the word, they think this is like, it's like this credit card that you have in your pocket that gives you permission 
in God's name to exploit, you mm. know? And mm. uh, yeah. Well, this, we were talking about this. In the, so in the Episcopal world, um, there's a big social media conflict happening right now. Yeah. And I won't ask you to weigh in on it, but, um, but it relates to what you're saying about the, the theological underpinnings of... of um, so for us, we don't have to worry so much about being fundamentalists in our tradition, except maybe about our prayer book, right? I mean, that's where we, that's where you expre- we express our, um, you can't mess with this piece. And our theology is manifest in our prayer book, um, which is, th- I don't think there's any way to argue that our prayer book doesn't, Im- I can't think of the way to argue that our prayer book doesn't emerge from the colonial era yes. of the Church of England. And so would be full of those ideas, right? And so we're, part of what we struggle with, and a lot of your friends are in this conversation on, in social right now, um, is when we do things that are exclusive or that define our community exclusively, um, we have to be really careful about how much of that is the baggage of that era, yeah. um, as opposed to the, perhaps an innocence that the first century or second century church might have had um, because of their a different proximity to power, maybe. Yeah. So in some ways, this is really uninteresting and kind of opaque, but also at the heart of what you're saying, mm-hmm. right, that so these ideas are baked into how we understand yeah. what it means to be Christian. And for us, where we manifest them is we read them in that prayer book um, week after week, yes. or we sing the hymns. Um, yeah. And so even if we have a different idea in the pulpit, you know, or you, we write a different yeah. thing, or you know, John thinks different than that, um, they're going to be, in the same way that some places will say CNN and Fox have them all week, you know, and then we get 30 minutes, yeah. right? Um, the whole service is all of that, hist- is all of that. Yeah. and then we have eight minutes to say something a little bit different. So let's talk about that, because in our tradition, it's not that, it, that liturgy is overtly saying offensive things. Right. Right, or that, it, that, that they, it, it's a little more subtle than that. Yes. Right, Could you, so tell us sure. about that theology. Okay, so I wondered, uh, uh, I, I'm, I'm glad we're talking about this, but can I just like tell everybody to put on your construction helmet or fasten your <laughs> seatbelt or whatever. But uh, maybe I can explain this by asking everybody to imagine something with me for a minute. I want you to imagine a group of white people saying Almighty God, and I want you to imagine a group of black people saying Almighty God. Do you see it already? I bet a bunch of you see it already. When you have people who have all the power and the God they pray to is Almighty God, what is that saying to them? Oh God, who will use all of your power to keep us in power. But when you imagine people who've been in what sociologists call the subaltern or the dominated or the oppressed position and they pray to Almighty God, do you understand what they're saying? Is you're the God who can flip over the pyramid and you're the God who can liberate from Egypt, and you're the God. See, so the word Almighty God has opposite meanings depending on who's saying it. Hmm. Or to be a chosen people. Oh my gosh. Right? <laughs> uh, it's all over our prayer. It, it depends a lot on who's saying it. Uh. And, and even to use a phrase dear to Episcopalians, the people of God. Hmm. Um, what does that say? I was in a charismatic uh, I was invited to preach at a uh, Pentecostal church a couple years ago and uh, and I, I remember this because the, the pastor said it's a very simple service one song then you preach then one song so I like I didn't have a complicated yeah. um, liturgy to keep no, track no of verger. no verger was required <laughs> so the first song was a song uh, any any folks from evangelical or charismatic uh, congregations or backgrounds will know it the the chorus I memorized the chorus uh, it was oh how he loves us um, but the thing is we sang that for about eight minutes <laughs> and and about eight minutes I'm looking at my watch because I'm thinking uh, I wonder how soon I'll preach you know I, I, I wasn't in the moment let's just say but I Oh, how he loves us. And the first thing I notice is the he. It's just he, he, he. And so this reinf- reinforcement of a male deity, I'm thinking, is anybody paying attention to this, you know? And then a few minutes later, it was us. And this was a room of almost all white people. 
And I thought, nobody would consciously think this, but singing, oh, how he loves us, when the only us is white people in the room, I start to think, does anybody see what's going on? But then what really hit me was it about minute 16, because <laughs> the, <laughs> the and, and I thought, who convinced these people that God hated them so much that they need to sing for 16 minutes to convince themselves mm -hmm. that God loves them. And I sort of felt this weight of all the shame that is heaped on people and this sort of threatening image of God and mm. all the rest. And, mm. uh, you know, but that was just sort mm. of a simple example of, of how this sort of thing, uh, it has a subliminal, uh, subliminal effect. But here's where it really becomes a big issue. Uh, so this is where, you know, the construction helmet is needed. I believe that the, that the way human beings are living with the earth, to come back to racial issues, it's, it's the poor of the world and it's people of color who are going to suffer the most. After suffering so much already, it's the, it's the people in India and Bangladesh, and it's the people in Africa, uh, and it's the people in inner cities here that are, you know, like, can you all, did, it was just a couple of months ago, the temperature in India, yeah. Yeah. was it yeah. 140? Yeah. yeah. Right. So do you understand, if you live in a city yeah. mm. and the air temperature is 130, do you know what happens to the cement on those walls and how they hold the heat and radiate it? I mean, when, and, and you know, it's a freak thing that the temperature goes over 130 now, but in 30 or 40 years, there are millions of people who are going to face extended drought. So I think this is that serious. Yeah. I'm, I'm telling the truth here, and you might think I'm totally crazy. I think every denomination should say we must rewrite, rewrite every word of our liturgies to be sure that every single week reinforces our connection to the God of creation and begins to build in us a different mm. attitude toward creation mm -hmm. and that is also related to a different attitude about race and, a di and look, a different attitude about sin because we have confessions of sin and we had those same confessions of sin for all the years of slavery and all the years of uh, American apartheid, mm. of Jim Crow. And mm. somehow people said the word sin and never thought of racism yeah. or never thought of chauvinism or, or uh, and all the rest. So to me, like what I, 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 I could just imagine if this were on Episcopal Twitter. <laughs> but look, any responsible Episcopalian who's arguing about religious esoterica uh, and is not saying what damage is our business as usual liturgy doing to the future of our children and grandchildren. Yeah. If someone could tweet that, that would be great. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I think, but it's interesting how, you know, the, the words matter. Yeah. You know, and it's, uh, you know, it's been fascinating to watch um, in the policy realm in our country, you know, and certainly in my lifetime, where you would think that what really drives policy is data, yeah. you know, and numbers, <laughs> but it's narrative. And yes. it's the power of these yes. stories. Yes. And we are people of the narrative. We are yes. people of story. Yes. You know, and yes. so I think it's up to us to really interrogate and, and to, um, to really interrogate those and, yeah. and always, always understand context. Yeah. You know, this. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shift gears for a second, and then I know we've got some questions. So I'm, I'm curious as to where you're seeing hope. Mm. You know, what's, what, when you look out at the work that's being done in terms of, you know, uh, fighting climate change or climate justice, where are you seeing hope? Where are the glimmers for you, both overall and even in faith communities? Yeah. Where are you seeing the, where are you seeing the, oh, that, that's really making a difference. That's, that has possibilities. Yeah. Um, so, John, I, I promise I'll answer that question. 
but th I have to say that um, I, I'm rethinking what I mean by the word hope mm. Um, mm. a lot lately. And I, I've been struggling with this for, I don't know, seven or eight years. I've, I've tried to write about this in various places, and I just feel like I never really hit it. And I just came across a quote from Vaclav Havel, the former uh, the last president of Czechoslovakia and I guess the first president of the Czech Republic. Um, a, a, a unique person in modern history because he was a poet and a president. Not, that doesn't go together too often. Um, and I, I haven't memorized the quote yet, but he says something like this. Hope is not seeing positive trends and deciding to be optimistic. Hope is the conviction that some things are worth doing, however things turn out. Hmm. D do you feel the difference? Hmm. Like, because when we look for signs of, signs of hope, what we're basically saying is, if the trend lines are good enough, like it looks like we'll succeed, I'll keep working at it. But if the trend lines aren't that good, what the heck, you know, might as well give up. You know what hmm. I'm saying? Yep. And, and what I think yep. Vaclav Havel captured there is, no, what hope is, is saying, if, you, if I knew that I would fail, I would still do this because it's the right thing to do. That, to me, is the hope that, yep. uh, you know, but at the same time, yep. there really are encouraging signs. Like, let's just say it this way. All of the technology we need to solve climate change is available. All of the, the technology mm. is available. Now, it can, and it will all be improved. But if we only had the technology we had now, we could, uh, we could you, you know, climate change is inevitable. Uh, global warming is inevitable. But our big goal is to keep it under 1.5 centigrade. And it lasts like the worst possible. We can't let it go above 2 degrees centigrade. That's going to be horrible. But we got to keep it under 1.5. And we've got all the technology we need to do that. And that wasn't true 20 years ago. It's really, it's really true now. Not only that, but uh, gas prices going up is always a good thing for the long-term climate. It's not a good thing for any of us short-term with our pocketbooks, but long-term, gas should cost a lot more than it does. You understand the only reason gas is cheap is because we externalize the cost. We, um, the use of fossil fuels costs all of us in huge numbers of ways. It's just that we keep making our children and grandchildren have to pay the biggest bill on it, you know? So, mm. so in a strange way, what that does is accelerates smart business people saying we need to invest in, in new, new forms of energy. Um, uh, COVID said, taught us that we could work from home. COVID taught us that we can, instead of having to fly everywhere, do a lot more by Zoom. COVID taught us that we could be way more flexible than we realized. All of those things are positive, you know, things. Actually, the, the, Pastor Warnock preached about this at some point in the last year or so that talked about there was, there's actually evidence now that one of the things COVID did is actually gave the earth a break. Yeah. And there were some things that actually came back yes. that, had, yeah. that had gone away for a while. Yes. So, and, and then I think we have to say that younger generations and everybody who is away from uh, super prosperous countries get climate change way more than older people do. And the older people who don't get it will die. Um, <laughs> and, th you know, th so there's a certain inevitability. The question is, like, we literally are in this nip and tuck race between will enough of those people die <laughs> before so much damage is done yeah. that it's irreversible. Uh, and I'm not wishing anybody to die. I'm just, uh, but <laughs> well, you, know, you know, some, some, ha some have interpreted the Exodus story, you know, yeah, the 40 years yeah. in the desert in that way. Yeah. It's like the folks that were in bondage needed to die yeah. so that they could imagine a new future. You know, it, I tell you that is so profound because 
actually one of my first environmental awakenings. I, I, I literally, I remember this. I was probably seven or eight years old and we were driving on vacation. I lived in New York at the time. We were driving on vacation to Florida and my grandparents went on vacation with us. So my poor grandparents are in the back seat of an old 1957 Pontiac with two little squirmy boys. <laughs> God bless them. And, <laughs> And we're going through Florida, and I, I'd never seen an oil derrick before. You know those little uh, things that go mm -hmm. like this? And I see an oil derrick, and I say to my grandfather, Grandpa, what's that? And he explains that it's pumping oil out of the ground. And I said to him, what? And, and he said, and we use that oil to make gasoline to make the car run. And I said, Grandpa, what happens when they pump out all the gasoline or all the oil? And my grandfather looked at me like, he said, the world is really big. There's a lot of oil. We'll never run out. <laughs> wow. And I just remember thinking, poor grandpa, he just doesn't get it. It was just, you know, like, I think because I grew up in the time when astronauts took pictures of the earth, and I had this feeling that the earth was small. My grandfather was born in the, eight, in the 1890s, and I don't think, the, I think to him the earth was, he never had a passport. The earth was infinitely big in his mind. And so, yeah, those kinds of changes, mm. generational changes are a big deal. Mm. <laughs> well, it's interesting because it, it, it goes back to this idea of what, what we teach, right? So I was thinking about, um, Episcopalians use the language of self-emptying a lot. Do, yes. do, do Baptists do that too? Yes. Yeah, it seems really dangerous if you're not sure what you're filling that back up with, yes. right? Yes. Um, and our teaching, right, this, is, this comes, points to some of the questions that are raised about you know, how, how do you, like, so we, we tend to cast this off, frankly, in our tradition that evangelicals have this problem, not mm. us. We clearly have this problem. So I'm going to ask it in this way, but it means us too. Kind of what, what, what breaks through for people about clim on the issue of climate change mm. for evangelicals? And I'm guessing it's the same thing that, that we need for ourselves. So I, I, one of the, uh, another really encouraging thing is uh, I'm uh, on the advisory board of an organization called Eco America. That's one of many, there are so many great organizations addressing uh, climate change. And some years ago, Eco America commissioned a study to find out what changed people's minds. And one of the things they found out is um, if you give people four pieces of information that can be convincing, as soon as you go to five, it becomes less convincing. Mm -hmm. um, there's something called complexity bias that when, if, if it gets, people prefer a simple lie to a complex truth, mm -hmm. something in our brains, right? So um, if you give people three or four pieces of information and they know what they are and they know the order that's the most convincing. So first, if, if for some reason, this is, with, this is specifically tested with conservative Christians who don't believe in climate change. For some reason, you tell them this, uh, over 98% of scientists agree that climate change is real and is caused by humans, which is a fact, but I would think that would not be that convincing, but that's the first piece of information that, that it helps people hear. Second, it is our God-given responsibility to care for the earth and the people uh, in it. Third, uh, because of climate change, poor people will suffer most. Now, I'm a little surprised that mm -hmm. that uh, is convincing with people, but if you tell them uh, poor people will, will suffer most, and then if you give them some note of hope, and say, and this is within our power to do something about it uh, if we work together and we work quickly. Um, and that simple message, it doesn't change like 80% of people or 70% of people or 50% of people. It might change a very small percentage, but it changes more than anything else. Mm -hmm. But here's the thing. The biggest argument for people changing their mind on this is the weather and the climate, when they experience, you know, you know weather is the short-term fluctuations, climate is the trends of weather. And as people begin to see, yeah, there really are a lot of wildfires. Yeah, there really, yeah, and they, they, they and, and it's, you know, hunters and fishermen who watch a cable news station that tells them climate change isn't real, they go fishing and there aren't the fish that used to be there. 
and they go hunting and there aren't the game uh, that used to be there. And they, they notice after they drive through the country and they get home, they used to have to clean off their windshield because of the bugs and they notice that doesn't happen. Uh, and mm. that's reality actually. <laughs> yeah. But the problem is with reality, it, it becomes really convincing when it's too late, which is why we have to do this other work now, you know. Mm, amen. I, I, I have to say I was, I've, been, I've been thinking about a lot kind of in your opening comments around um, kind of constricted theology. Yeah. Um, and I started thinking about the, you know, algorithms yeah. in technology. Yeah. Mm. And, and, and then, uh, you know, and then you start to wonder how much, how much, how much that methodology yeah. kind of works across, across our society. Yeah. You know, yeah. that's really built in building echo chambers. Yes. You know, and, 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 and we, even in our own partnership, have to remind ourselves how do we step outside of those echo chambers because I mean there certainly is difference between St. Luke's and Ebenezer but there's a you have a whole lot more in common yeah. you know here than we might when we go to Valdosta or yeah. Columbus or Albany and um, and and I think the, the next challenge I think f at least for us in our partnership is how do we how do we step outside of those bubbles yeah. But I tell you, those bubbles can be pretty comfortable places, yeah. you know. And particularly, I, w I would say, you know, for us as faith communities, this sense of, like, I mean, I'm fortunate to be at a place like Ebenezer where you don't have to make the case for why you're involved with social justice. Yes. You know, but that's unusual. That is, yeah. In churches. Yeah. And that oftentimes you hear more of the stories of, you know, it just would be easier if you just don't talk about that stuff. Yeah. You know, I, like I deal with that all the time. Just, yeah. You know, I come to church just to be, just preach me a good sermon and let me, you know, go to a nice program and go home. It's just, yeah. it's just a lot easier. And so it, it, it feels like there's a, you know, the, the, I love that, that comment around hope, yeah. which it also kind of, it, it fights that, yeah. It, it's, it's almost hope is almost counterintuitive. Yeah. If you will. Uh, yeah. 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 And, and this is where uh, on the positive side, like if we were to imagine this, if we could all get in a bus and, oh, we could probably walk. We could walk to any place nearby where there's a tree growing. And we were to say, instead of listening to a sermon, we just would like to invite you to sit under this tree and notice this tree. If you wanna pull out your phone and Google, learn about the tree, this tree is your sermon. I can just about guarantee if anyone was curious about a tree for 15 or 20 minutes, they're going to experience something like worship they're going to experience something like love. They're going to experience awe. And when you love something, you want to save it. You want to protect it. Mm. And, um, and, and this is so deeply rooted in our theology. Uh, so then, if after spending that time with the tree, we were to say, let's read Genesis 1, and, and you read... Uh, and, and of course we could say because we take the Bible seriously we don't have to take it literally taking it literally is a way of not taking it seriously mm. so you, we don't have to get into arguments about Genesis and, and as you know a young earth we can read it and say isn't it interesting God's first language is light mm. that light is an expression of God and that Gravity is an expression of God and water is an expression of God and trees are an expression of God and that when you admire and experience and are in awe of these things, you're being in awe of God. You, we help people mm. not just think that but feel it. And then they flip ahead and they get to the Sermon on the Mount 
And Jesus says, you know, not a single bird falls to the earth without God taking notice. I, I, was, just, mm. uh, I was just walking in a park a, a, a week ago, and there was, uh, do you know what a, a, a collared dove is? It's like, it's like a pigeon, but it's, another, it's related to a pigeon. And um, a dove had built a nest up in a tree, and there were two almost ready to fledge uh, uh, baby doves in the, in the little f- f- uh, stick nest. And a crow came in and swiped one of the babies out of the nest and went down and started pecking it. It was going to eat, kill, and eat part of the baby. And there was a mom in this park with her two little kids, and she ran over and swatted that crow away and chased <laughs> it away. And so we're trying to, uh, so then I go and help her, and we're trying to catch the little baby dove because we want to be able to put it somewhere where the mother can continue to feed it until uh, it would fly. And then that stinking crow came back and knocked the other baby out. Pretty soon, about eight or ten people in this park have come around in this project to save the baby doves. And here's the thing. Everybody knew that's a fellow creature and we care about that creature. And the crow can find some food somewhere else. But these <laughs> little babies, right? And of course, we know that, you know, that's part of nature too. Things die in ways that we wouldn't prefer. But what was striking to me is how people were brought together in love and nobody had to say, you have a duty to do this. Uh, you know, this is an endangered species. Listen, <laughs> European collared doves are invasive species. They aren't endangered, but they're here. But it was just this feeling like when you recognize life, you, you care about it. Mm. And that's, Jesus does that too. He says, if you're a farmer and you have an ox that falls into a pit or falls, you know, you, you don't say it's the Sabbath. I'm going to just let him sit there <laughs> until tomorrow. Your human compassion for an animal makes you care. And, and he takes that as a baseline. So suddenly you see all of this. It, this is part of the spirituality of Jesus. Mm-hmm. You know? mm-hmm. so. I love also in the, in the Genesis stories, I was rereading it recently, and after each day, God says, it is good. It's good. Before it's good. there are people there. That's right. Before, that's right. <laughs> It is good. Yeah. It is good. Like you just think um, dinosaurs have, were around for a really, really long time. And I don't think God was like, <laughs> I just can't wait till we get some church buildings with narthexes built so we can have a prelude and, and meet in the sacristy. I don't think that was, you know. Hey, hey now. <laughs> But do you go from preaching to meddling? (laughs) (laughs) And I love love the architecture. I love it. This is part of God's creation too because God's beloved human beings makes this kind of creation. But the the point is to think that whoever, whatever God is, right? Um, Dinosaurs were really, really interesting for a long time. And Mm. there were no people around and it was still good. Mm. Mm. One of the questions is kind of relates to that. I feel like it's a, it's a tension for Christians between um, our stewardship of the earth, right, and the care of the earth, and God's dominion. Yeah. Right. God's like what? What is the power of God or the will of God? How do you? How do you drive people to stay in the lane for the compassion for the dove? I, 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 I'll throw this out there and any of you want to explore it, you know, I encourage you to explore it because this is a huge subject. But l- l- take the word dominion. The word dominion means it's the same root as domination and it has the idea of a king, a, 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 a king's rule. Now, first let's say that any king, if you go into a kingdom and the land is polluted and the forests are dying and the fields are infertile, you'd say this is a pretty crappy king. You know, this king doesn't know much about running a kingdom, right? So even the old idea of dominion, the, the quality of the land 
it, and the vitality of the land is a reflection on the king. Mm. Um, so even if we stick with that, but here's the thing. Let's realize that probably there were no kings if we were to go back much more than 3000 BC. I mean, we might have had tribal chiefs or something, but there wasn't, weren't really kings. So can we say this? Before 3000 BC, God was not a king. Mm. It's a human construct. It's a human metaphor. It's a human idea. And I personally think that if we were smart, we would stop talking about God as a king. Hmm. Unless we could talk about it knowing that it's an archaic metaphor for a world that we don't even understand or inhabit. Because here's the thing. In, in the Bible, they used metaphors for God that were relevant to their current moment. Like, let's say David was writing in uh, about, what, when, when was David? About 1,000 B.C. Let's say it's about 1,000 B.C. I might be wrong on that, but let's say it's about 1,000 B.C. David could refer to God as king. David could refer to God as shepherd. Uh, because kings and shepherds were part of daily life. David didn't have to say, I need to use imagery from 1,400 years ago because that's biblical, <laughs> right? <laughs> you have to use outdated imagery to refer to God. That's how we show that God is holy. Use outdated imagery. But no, they use contemporary imagery. So what if what we really need is to say, look at how the Bible uses contemporary imagery in its time. What's the contemporary imagery we need to think about God in our time? So you have to tell us. I mean, this is what could be so much fun if we stop having silly arguments about liturgical fundamentalism and instead we're to say, what if what's happening right now is the religious industrial complex is having a collapse because it's time, and younger people are not wanting to be part of it because they go into church and they feel like they're being invited not into another building, but into another millennium. Mm. Mm. And, and mm -hmm. they would say, why shouldn't I be able to meet God in my millennium, you know, my, my time? And what the, so, but what would be so much fun is to set people free uh, to do that. I, I wish I should memorize this poem, but Padre Gotuma has a poem. I, I'm going to butcher it and paraphrase it, but it, it goes something like this. God of many names. Hagar gave you a name. And if you know the story in Genesis, Hagar was an Egyptian slave of Abram and Sarah, and they treated her like, like dirt. And she was rejected by them, and she found out that God cared about her. So she calls God the living one who sees me. Mm. She makes up a new name, the living one who sees me. Mm -hmm. Hagar gave you a name. And then it says, we do not destroy old names that, because those names have brought us to where we are now. But God, we need new names for you hmm. because we need new names that will bring us from this point forward. And hmm. to me, like just Hagar gives the example, the, the living one who sees me. Hmm. Hmm. You know, if I try praying this week, O oh, living one who sees me, and s see what happens, you know. It, I think it mm. takes you to a different place than almighty uh, or even father. Look, I, I'm, I'm all for father's really important metaphor. It's just a metaphor. Mm. And so at the liturgy here today, we ended up with that wonderful benediction. D is it's that Janet Morley. Janet Morley's benediction. Do you, do you have it memorized? I, I don't. Uh, I have one memorized, but the one we had was not the one. I, it's what is it? The God who dances in creation. Where's Elizabeth? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, shout it out to us. So the God who dances in creation, who embraces us with human love, who shakes our lives like thunder. Bless us and drive us out with power. 
to fill the world with her justice? I think, I think that some of it is taking place, but I don't think it's happening in the church. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It was, I remember um, my first Black Lives Matter march in New York. We started, you know, we started in Harlem and walked down Lexington mm-hmm. Avenue. But I remember being with these young people before him, and it was, it was the organizers, it was a pep rally. Mm. I mean, it had that feel. It had a little church, but, you know, and it, but, it, but they, were, they, were, they were using words of belonging and connection yes. and that sense of, yes. the, you know, and, and that, that embrace of until all black people are free, Yes. Not just the straight, the queer, the LGBT, the rich, yes. the poor, the all black people are like like yes. like the th- that sense of the sense of articulating radical inclusiveness. Yes. You know, there's language that's bubbling up there which has been sometimes very fearful yes. for us within churches. In some ways, I think some of these movements are calling us to be better Christians. Oh my. And yes. so, so I think that some of the language is happening. You know, it's happening outside of the church. And that spirituality hasn't disappeared. Yes. But, it's, but it's present, you know, and it's out there. And so I, maybe, maybe part of it is for us to having the eyes to see what may be happening outside of our walls as a way to inform, to kind of rethink what's happening inside our walls. You, you just, you just, uh, that's a gift. Thanks for saying that to me. Because as soon as you said that, I thought we always refer, you know, it's part of our tradition to speak of the God of Abraham, mm-hmm. Isaac, and Jacob. What would happen if we said, oh God of Breonna Taylor and George Floyd and Emmett Till? Ooh, yeah. because instantly that would mean something that I think our hearts would say, yeah. yes, yes, yes. Yeah. That's the God. If Hagar could say the God who sees me, we'd say the God who sees Emmett, who, 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 the, the God who was with Emmett Till and the God, you know, and mm-hmm. I mean, it would wake us up. Uh, it would yeah. wake us up. Mm-hmm. I, you know, mm-hmm. I, I live, because of where I live, in Florida, I, I'm an avid kayaker, and this time of year, we have a bird that flies up. It lives in Brazil and Paraguay and Uruguay in the uh, winter and then flies to Florida in the summer. Most birds go in the opposite direction, but this is a bird that comes to us in the summer, and it's, it's called a swallowtailed kite. If you mm-hmm. Google it, it's one of the most amazing, beautiful birds and I'll tell you, if I pray to God of the swallowtailed kite, mm-hmm. something happens to me. And if you ever see one, you'll know exactly what I mean, right? Um, God of the humpbacked whale. Hmm. You, you feel hmm. it. You know it. And this could be, this could be our liturgies uh, of hmm. the future. Um, and I think it's there in the Bible, you know. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Have you seen the New Zealand prayer book? Yes. That, that's what they do, that's, right? That's exactly is. what they that's do. Right. And it's in their landscape, yes. right? You know, it seems to me one of the things we struggle with, and I, you know, I, I'm, I'm from Dallas, so it can, you kind of intuit Baptist culture in Dallas and yes. kind of fundamentalist culture. I don't come from it, but I, it's in my theology as well because, yeah. because of that place. And part of what, kind of, you can hear the other side of the, Conversation, right? Especially around climate, in particular, but it applies to every everything we've touched. Is that this is how it's supposed to be, yeah. right? That even God of the glacier, but that glacier is supposed to melt, yes. right? That that somehow we've been. It's like this. It's it's a pretty pr- kind of profound formation that we that that God is at work in the world, and we're just we're just hoping for our own salvation, oh. and from this kind of narrow lane of sin that we personally control. Yeah. Um, how, I'm kind of asking, how do you fight that? 
yeah. in the world, in ourselves. It's, it's in us, right? It's not, just, it's not just out there. We can keep mm. going, we think. And, and you know, this really ties back, um, John, to, to what you were saying about the power of narrative. Um, because our, our deeper problem is that the Christian faith has a dominant narrative that it inherited, not from Jesus and not from John the Baptist and not from Mary. We inherited it from Augustine and Aquinas and Calvin and, and a few other people. Um, and it's a narrative that makes it sound like the story uh, is not the story of creation. It's, it's the story of evacuation. Mm. Um, it's the story mm. of disincarnation. Mm. Get our souls out of our bodies up to heaven as soon as possible. Uh, it's just amazing how we reverse the polarity. It's so ironic too. We pray the Lord's Prayer and we do not pray, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. May we come to your kingdom in heaven where your will is done unlike here on earth. It's not what we pray, um, but it's what we mean, <laughs> a lot of us, right? And so I think this is a deep change in our, in our narrative that in the end will make us way more biblical. And again, this is a little bit like what we were talking about with climate change. The good news is this theological work has been done, you know? I, I mean, uh, so, so I say this as a white guy, what has saved my Christian faith is an insight from black theology, which is the most obvious insight in the world, but I as a white guy was never taught this. And that is that the primary narrative in the Hebrew Bible is the Exodus. And the Exodus makes the audacious claim that God will disrupt the empire to set the slaves free. I mean, that's the most obvious thing in the world that I was well taught to not see because I was taught this is all about my individual soul going to heaven when I die and everything was about my individual sin, not social sin, not systemic injustice. And that whole narrative is deeply, deeply embedded. And people are afraid if you lose that narrative, you lose Jesus and the Bible and God. Mm. No way, you get it all mm. back a hundred times over. Yeah. Um, but that's part, a huge part of what's at stake. The other thing that's interesting though in that, Brian, is that, you know, and I think it, it's really come more in adulthood for me, is that, you know, the Jesus narrative is also about empire, yeah, you know? That's right. And, but, and how often we don't, we don't really talk about yeah. that, you yeah. know? And like they were making an example yeah. of Jesus, you know, and he, and, and that a lot of what his ministry was about was, was really disrupting the empire. Yeah. You know, and also, and, and at times, how we can get colluded, yeah. we as faith communities can collude with yeah. empire. And, you know, and, and so the importance of telling those stories, yeah. you know, I think is, um, to me, seems really important oh for us goodness. as faith communities. And for people who love the Bible, it's like you, you, if you just say, I'm going to go back and read the four Gospels and I'm going to look for themes of power, empire, domination. It's like, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a page turner. Yeah. And all the stuff you used to skip over to get to the verses that you yeah. extracted, suddenly it all has meaning, you know? Yeah. So every time you read about a tax collector, you realize, oh, this is somebody from our people who is now working and getting rich by working for the people who are oppressing us. And you, every time you read a story about a, a steward, yeah. a steward was somebody who uh, goes to extract uh, tribute, what do you call it? Like rent uh, from, from poor farmers who are tenant farmers and in order to stay on their land, they have to give a percentage of their crop Poor people who are barely surviving have to give a percentage of the crop to rich people who have incredible luxury. Every time you read about a wine, uh, a, a vineyard, it's why were there vineyards in Israel? Because the Romans could afford a lot of wine 
and they, you could export wine to the Romans. And so you would get as many people off the land as you could so you could turn their farms into vineyards because if the rich people aren't worried about food, they're worried about more money, right? All of that's there. It's, it's there. And it's like we, it took hundreds of years to make sure we didn't see it. And know? perhaps with the, if you know that context, you might never confuse God for that owner ever. <sighs> which is where we always see God. That's right. right? Mm -hmm. Because we don't oh. know the context. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, th that's an, another whole subject for those of you who love uh, the Gospels. Uh, we're always taught to see God in the vineyard owner or in the, in the guy with the wealth and the power. What if, try reading the parables where maybe God is showing up in the guy who gets thrown out or the one who gets killed instead of the one who does the killing because that was going to be Jesus's narrative, right? So, yeah. Or even the one that buries yeah. the coin, like oh that's a part goodness. of, yeah. Yeah. It, yeah, yeah, for that one, you know, the one about, yeah. I, I preached this in a, the opposite way I would preach it now so many times. You remember the, the guys are given different amounts of talents, which is a measure of, well, of money, and one of them hides it in the ground. Well, another way to read that story is to say, if somebody came and told you in, in the last six months I've made a hundred percent interest on my investment, hmm. you would think uh, that's uh, pretty extreme. And somebody else says, I made 50 percent. You say, that's, I've never heard of a 50 percent return on investment in six months. And somebody else says, 30 percent. I've never heard of that. Uh, that's exploitive. That's exploitive uh, investment. Could you imagine somebody saying, I do not want to exploit anybody, so I'm going to bury this money in the ground. I can give it back that way. I won't lose it. I just don't want to play in an exploitive economy. That parable looks the very opposite in that way. And then when that guy gets thrown out and the master says you're an unfaithful servant, instead of seeing him as the bad guy who's getting sent to hell, you see this is what they say about Jesus, Jesus when he won't play their game. Mm. And he's going to be thrown out and he's going to be tortured and killed. I mean, yeah. wow. Well, and that story that. actually makes sense, right? Like when you're, as you're reading <laughs> the gospel, does. that actually makes sense. Where's the one, anyway, the other way we tell the story, it makes no sense in the rest of the narrative, but there it is. So yeah. we're going to try to do something with it. Yeah. Is there something in the, wh wh where would you say we are? In, so you, well, let me back it up. So you've mentioned the people that have to die for things to get better, if things move along. Um, wh wh where are we in that trajectory? Are there, as, as we know that climate change is real and urgent and there's crisis in front of us, but where do you see us, like where are we landing in engaging it? And how do you see that generationally in, in our okay. faith communities? So I'm, uh, I'm a foreigner in the land of Georgia because I'm a, a Florida citizen now, right? So can I just say, your state is so important, mm. uh, as you well know, mm. um, because part of what's going on in our world is we've had this experiment called democracy, and democracy mm. uh, uh, is, is easily corrupted and subverted uh, by super rich people. And... Uh, Here's a, a way to, to say it. I, I, I can't give you the exact number, but it's probably less than 30. There are probably 30 individuals in the world who control enough carbon that's still in the ground that if they burn it, we're all screwed. That's a theological term. <laughs> uh, it's probably less, but it's certainly no more than 30. So what you could say is 30 people have so much power that they could make decisions to burn. And you know what will happen. One of them will say, well, I'm burning my share, but the other 29 can't burn their share. And so all 30 of them can make that excuse. Mm. And the only way, but, but the good news is, it's a small number of people who have that power. And there's a whole lot more of us. You would think that almost 8 billion people could 
outvote 30. But we're at a situation where it's not certain that will happen. Um, and that's why democracy is really important. So one of the things that really has to happen is, you know, we, we have an awful lot of work to do in this. If democracy fails, um, uh, there, it, it may be that, there, that we'll find other forms of activism that could work. Um, one of them being economic activism. So I was consulted by the, uh, I, I, I'll just say it. I was consulted by the Church of England, somebody in the Church of England who, has, who is in leadership over the investment of the Church of England's pension funds. And if you take the Church of England, the United Methodists, and the Roman Catholic Church, they have so many investments they could uh, play an incredible role in stopping climate change because all they would have to do is pull their investments and say, we will not invest in fossil fuels. We will instead, uh, it, it, we'll go public and we'll ask all of the people in our denominations to clean up their investments and pull their investments out of fossil fuels and we will uh, start investing in alternative technology and so on. This, this could be done. So at, at the failure of democracy, even at, as much as I hope that we will save the democracy in the next few years, and Georgia will once again be the heroes, thank you. Those of us south of the border are <laughs> deeply appreciative. Um, please thank Raphael for us. <laughs> um, in a non-political way. <laughs> but... Um, but uh, but there, are, there will be forms of economic activism. And if the economic activism fails, there are other things that will certainly happen um, because 30 people should not be able to ruin the lives of billions of, of people. Brian, let me build on this for a second. And I'm, I'm curious, like we're here as people of faith. And we believe actually faith communities can make a difference. We yeah. believe God can make a difference. We worship a God who transforms. Yes. And we worship a God who makes a way out of no way. Yeah. Like that, that's, that's an important part of our theology. Yes. So what, what, what is the unique voice or the unique role that faith communities can yes. play around climate change, you know, and even around yes. some of the other things we've been talking about? So, see, this is to me the enormous power of the gospel. You know, when Jesus says that word, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent, the word kingdom could equally be translated empire. Repent, the empire of God at, is at hand. At hand means within reach. Repent doesn't mean feel guilty and ashamed. Repent means change your way of thinking. Think again. Th rethink everything. Hmm. A different way of life, a way of life centered in and on God, is within reach. Hmm. I mean, that gospel message is exactly the message the world needs. Not only that, but remember when Jesus said, you will either love God and hate money or hate God and love money. Like that sounds like such an uncapitalist thing to say. I guess it is. Um, but here's the interesting thing. God and money are the two ways that you can value everything. So in, in American history, an enslaved person was called a hand. Hmm. That human being was only valued for the hand that can pick cotton. And, and, and money valued that human being as a hand. God valued that human being as a precious human being. So do you understand, when you talk about loving God and hating money, what you're saying is 
depending on whether you let money set your values or God set your values, you will live such different lives. And this applies to human beings. It applies to, and it applies to the earth. Well, and when God sets your values, Mm -hmm. your relationship to money, your relationship to the earth, your relationships become different and and they become transformed. That's right. And I think that's why Jesus uses that strong language, you'll hate money. Because I think what he's saying is, you'll see how money causes such injustice. The love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. That could catch on as a statement. Mm. Uh, <laughs> write that down. Yeah. But this write is, that down. Yeah, <laughs> but it. this is like, no, it's money that, that gives people crazy values, that they, they don't value things the way they should, you know? Mm. So that, yeah, that rich people deserve to have great health care because they have money, this gives them value. And poor people, just let them be sick and die. You, you know, from, in my view, from a God perspective, that's blasphemous. It's blasphemous, you know. But it's acceptable when God, when, when, when you love money rather than love God in that way. Mm-hmm. This is why uh, one of my favorite people on Twitter, uh, dear friend, if, you, if you're on Twitter, you can follow David Dark. But David says, there are so many ways to hate God. Hmm. And he says, there are so many ways to love God. Hmm. And it's his way of trying to get us to see these different values that Hmm. live out in our our daily lives. Yeah. Hmm. Thank you. That that repent for the kingdom of the God of Brianna Taylor is near might be what I take away from. Wow. This is amazing. Can you help me thank... um, I think I learned more than in three years of seminary in this hour and a half. Oh my God. I tell you. Mind blown. John, do you have anything you want to, do we have more closing to do or? Um, I think, uh, I don't think that I do. I mean, I think at this point it's uh, a closing prayer, but also to express my gratitude, I'm glad that Pastor Warnock was not able to make it today. <laughs> <laughs> this was this was this it was it was great, and I think it's it really is. It's you know I, I leave a conversation like this thinking that our charge is to really take God seriously and to take Jesus seriously um, and take our faith seriously. Um, and there, that we have the resources. You know, we have, we have the resources and the know-how. And so thank you for saying yes. Thank you for being with us. And uh, we'll just have to have you back again yeah, at some absolutely. point. So absolutely. So I'm tasked to close us out, I think, in a word of prayer. Thank you to all of you that are here. Let me thank everybody who is with us online, uh, both the St. Luke's and the Ebenezer everywhere, folks. We're really glad that you're able to, to be with us. Let us take a moment to, um, I'd say I open with prayers. Can I, I, I think I, maybe I kick it back to you. Absolutely. All right. Yeah, happy to do that. God be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Oh, God of all who walk our streets, all who are hungry, all who are outside, those who fear guns, those who have been shot with guns. God of this beloved earth, make us lovers of you and of one another. God bless Brian McLaren, the people of St. Luke's and Ebenezer. Amen. 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 Thank you.